Great. Uh, thank you very much. It's super exciting to be here, and I'm really pleased to be able to share with you some of the research that we're doing in my team. I thought I'd start by giving you a little potted history of how I got to be where I am today, uh, going all the way back to somewhat ancient history, uh, doing GCSEs uh, in South East London. So I grew up quite near close to the Meridian Line in Greenwich, and I started off life being really fascinated by uh, astrophysics, because growing up next to the Meridian Line, I had access to the Royal Observatory in Greenwich and spent a lot of my uh, childhood there, both uh, for fun and also working as a gallery assistant in the galleries. So with that in mind, I sort of uh, decided that I was really interested in physics and that would be a, a good way to go next. Uh, my school, by the way, has since been bulldozed, so it doesn't exist anymore in its uh, old form. Um, but my sixth form college is still there in, in its current, in its form. Um, I studied maths, further maths, physics and history at A-level. I couldn't quite bring myself to give up essay-based subjects because I've always loved writing and I find that actually as an academic, I spend about 80% of my time writing now, so it's just as well. I came up to Cambridge in 2002 to study for natural sciences um, with a specialty in physics and I started at Pembroke College. And actually, during the study of natural sciences, one of the nice things about the degree here is that you can choose a few different options in your first year. So actually, only a quarter of my first year was spent doing physics. I also studied maths and material science and evolution and behavior, another essay-based subject, kept that writing up. When I was studying material science, I have to admit, it was not my favorite topic, probably the, my least favorite uh, subject that I've ever had to study. But there was a really interesting set of lectures in the end of the academic year, which were given by um, an expert in biomaterials. And in those lectures, they introduced the concept of having um, biomaterials that were useful for hip implants and how inventing a technology that could be implanted into the humans to sustain replacement hips for longer had led to a massive impact on a large number of lives. And it got me thinking about how maybe physical sciences and engineering could be used for the benefit of humanity. And it sent me off in a path um, towards a PhD in radiation physics at UCL because I did an internship during my undergraduate degree um, building an X-ray computer tomography system to do X-rays of um, different samples of tissue that have been taken out of patients. Now, during my PhD, I used um, a special type of detector known as a CMOS active pixel sensor, which is now otherwise known as the camera in your smartphone, but back then, there weren't such things as smartphones, shock horror. Um, and we were using them to measure um, the scattering of x-rays from um, breast cancer. And we discovered that the scattering of x-rays is different if you shine them on a breast cancer sample than if you shine them on a normal healthy breast tissue specimen. And as a result of that, we're able to use some of those scattering properties um, to be informative about the disease. So until that time in my career, I had largely specialised in physics. I had also um, largely only interacted with other physicists and engineers. But I decided that one of the things that I'd really love to do um, as my career progressed was to be able to get closer to the people whose lives I was trying to impact, so to be closer to patients. The first step I took in that direction was to do a postdoctoral fellowship back at here in Cambridge. And I was um, fortunate to work in the Department of Biochemistry here in Cambridge. So I left behind my physics roots and immersed myself in the company of chemists, biologists, um, mathematicians, computer scientists in Kevin's lab. And what we were doing there was trying to study uh, metabolism in cancer. So how cancer cells use energy and how that differs from in normal tissue. And during that time, I did a, a chemistry project, which was far beyond my expertise, um, labelling and um, studying the distribution of vitamin C um, in cancer. And this was something that I was doing really new for the first time. It was the first time I held a pipette, um, first time I um, cultured cancer cells in a dish, and we worked with mouse models, we worked with magnetic resonance imaging. Um, and so this is really just a tale to tell you that no matter how far you go along your career, that you're always able to pivot and explore new areas if it's something that is interesting to you. I built on that experience moving even further towards the clinic and joined the radiology department at Stanford in the US um, as my next position. And there I worked on technologies that were being applied uh, for first in human studies in patients. And that really um, led me through this new technologies into the lab that I run today. So as was mentioned at the start, I'm jointly appointed here in the physics department and also at the Cancer Research UK Cambridge Institute. So I have a lab which we use to develop new hardware as well as software interpretation tools. 
And when we develop those new devices that we want to use to measure um, characteristics of patients, we then do some initial preliminary testing in the Cancer Institute before taking those actually into the hospital down at Addenbrooke's um, and studying in patients as well. So we have this pipeline trajectory from physics innovation through to hardware validation and into patient application. What are these tools that I keep talking about? What are the new imaging modalities that we're trying to develop? The catch-all term for these is something called multispectral imaging, and I'll say a little bit more about that. Multispectral imaging refers to imaging where you're taking a picture, either in 2D or 3D in space, but you have other dimensions on top of that, the most common of which is actually spectral, so it's wavelength resolved. So we're looking at different colours of light um, in an image um, by, by various different mechanisms. So to give you an example of that, here's a nice pretty picture of the sun. There'll be many less pretty pictures of guts as the presentation goes on, so I thought I'd start with a pretty picture of the sun. This is a multispectral view of the sun, which was taken by um, NASA, and it shows the, the visualization of the sun from wavelengths from the uh, 617 nanometers in the optical all the way through down to 9.4 nanometers in the extreme UV. And so the green end of this image is the extreme UV, and it goes all the way through um, to the, the near infrared. And what you can see as the, um, this view rotates is the wide variety of contrast that you can get in the image when you're looking at different wavelengths. And if we just look with our eyes at a given scene, we're binning much of that contrast together into the red, green, and blue color responses of our eyes. By spectrally resolving that in a wide range of different means, you can actually tease out some of these really subtle changes and use them to enhance contrast. So in my team, we use these with a tool called photoacoustics, which couples light with sound to generate depth resolved imaging data. Um, we also use it in endoscopy to bring together new modes of imaging that we can take directly to the site where we want to image. And to achieve this, we use a range of different innovations in optics and photonics. And we combine this with a, an increasingly high level of biophysical modeling. So building a model of the tissue that we want to image and then modeling how light propagates through that and also are using machine learning tools to help us to infer the biological properties that sit underneath the imaging data that we acquire. And we apply these te techniques both in preclinical studies, in cancer models, and here are some example photoacoustic images, um, and also in first in human clinical trials. And there's your first image of the uh, upper gastrointestinal tract or the food pipe. And what you see in the inset circle um, is a resected piece of tissue. Now, obviously, I don't have time to talk about all of that today, so what I'll focus on is our work in endoscopy um, and show you some of our data from first in human clinical trials. So for the remainder of the talk, I will first um, introduce you to the power of optical imaging and why it's important in the visualization of hemoglobin and what hemoglobin is. Um, I'll then talk to you about how we developed a translatable approach to be able to adopt this technology into endoscopy. Um, and then I'll give you some of the initial insights from our first in human testing and some perspectives on future applications. So if we start with um, the power of optical imaging, we need to go one step back and ask, well, why would we want to try to visualize uh, hemoglobin in the first place and what is this molecule? Well, many of you may be familiar with hemoglobin. It's the molecule um, that carries oxygen around our, our bodies um, encased in red blood cells. Um, and it has a different color depending on whether or not oxygen is bound. And that is the premise upon which much of the imaging that we do in my lab is based. So as uh, a tumor initiates and we get to a point where um, cancer cells are proliferating uncontrollably, they'll eventually reach a volume beyond which oxygen can no longer just diffuse into the mass. And that's typically accepted to be about a millimeter cubed. When they reach that um, volume, the, the cells in the center of the, the tumor mass will become what we call hypoxic, so they won't have access to oxygen or nutrients in order to survive. The result of this, biologically speaking, is that the cancer cells will send out signals to the surrounding environment. Um, these signals and factors will stimulate the growth of new blood vessels from any surrounding blood vessels, allowing the blood vessels to penetrate into the tumor mass and enabling the delivery of oxygen via those red blood cells and also maybe other agents, um, or ideally, uh, ultimately, the delivery of drugs, which can then be used to shrink the tumor. 
So there's a significant difference between the vascular supply that we get in a normal tissue where we have an arterial supply and a venous drainage and everything is um, organised into an ordered capillary network. In a tumour, this tends to be much more chaotic. That um, ball of cells has signalled out to the surroundings to grow um, vessels into it. So it often has a supply, but it's not very well organised. So we have two different limits on the supply of blood to a tumour, both the perfusion limit, how well the blood flows in, and also the diffusion limit, how well the oxygen can leave the red blood cells and perfuse out into the, the surrounding regions. We know that this process of oxygen starvation that cancer cells go through leads to a hypoxic stress or a stress induced by a lack of oxygen. And this, across a wide range of different solid tumours, has led um, us to know that we get very poor outcomes in patients where we have a high degree of hypoxia. What I'm going to talk to you about today is one particular case study of a condition that le leads people to have a high risk of developing uh, esophageal cancer but much of what I'll say um, applies broadly across the gastrointestinal tract. So this example um, of Barrett's esophagus, this is a condition which arises from chronic acid reflux between the stomach and the esophagus, and it's at the junction between those two organs. As a process of that chronic reflux, the cells in the esophagus, which are normally kind of flat and squamous, like you see on the left-hand side of this image, become more columnar and goblet-like, which is similar to the lining of the stomach. These cells are much more resistant to the acid and the damage that it can cause. Now, in and of itself, that condition is not harmful. Um, it's not pleasant, but it's not harmful. But having that condition gives you a, a small elevation in risk of going on to develop esophageal cancer, which is one of the deadliest cancers with a five-year survival rate of less than 10%. So if you have this condition, you are then enrolled in what we call a surveillance program. You're regularly asked to go to the hospital to have an endoscopy where the um, operating clinician can take a, a visual look and visually inspect um, your esophageal tract. What they're looking for are these signs of dysplasia, which are precancerous lesions. So they're not um, in and of themselves dangerous. But once you have them, you have a much higher risk of going on to develop cancer. Now, if we can detect these dysplastic lesions and the early signs of cancer, it's possible for the operating endoscopist to simply cut out that abnormal piece of tissue and the patient is cured. However, if the disease is allowed to progress further and penetrate further out into the esophagus, that is what we call a much more a late stage disease and it's much harder to treat, which is why the survival rates are so poor. So let's have a think about what process the patient goes through when they arrive at the clinic. So here's a, a kind of an example with an image from the lower GI tract, but it serves to kind of illustrate what's going to happen when they come into the clinic. So the operating endoscopist is going to introduce an endoscope. So for the lower GI tract, this is in the colon, um, and for the food pipe, it would be coming down the top. Um, we have at the bottom of this, um, this long tube, this endoscope, a camera, a light source, and you can pass into that various different uh, operating instruments such as forceps, which allow you to extract um, different pieces of tissue. All right, so now let's look in a bit more detail at the camera. So the camera is um, a, made up of something called a sensor, which catches the light that falls on it and converts that light into electricity. Um, so when you have bought a smartphone or have look, look, gone shopping for one, you'll probably have heard about pixels and how many pixels the camera has. The more pixels, the better. Um, this means the number of little elements that the camera has to catch the light. So each individual element here will respond, and the more light that falls, um, the higher the electricity will be. So here's an array of different pixels, um, and they have different brightness values depending on how many photons um, have fallen on each individual pixel. Now to see colour, what happens is that we put tiny little colour filters on top of each of those um, little sensors so that each one responds only to one colour of light. And typically these are red, green or blue, as these are the primary colours that we see with our eyes. But how does that become a colour photo? Well, we need a little bit more image processing to understand that. So here's a pixelated image where we're imagining the um, red, green and blue array or what we call the Bayer filter pattern um, projected on top of a, a visualised image there. And if we zoom in, we can see each of the little uh, filters that that raw photo is contributing. 
But the first thing that we do is we take all of the, the red pixels and put them in one image, all of the green pixels and put them in another image, and all of the blue pixels and put them in another image again. Then we fill in all the gaps, so the image that we capture with our camera is a slightly lower resolution than the actual image that we could capture um, but in the nature of these nested colour filters. And then we add them all back together, and that gives us our standard white light image that replicates our eyes. Now, I already told you that haemoglobin within red blood cells is a nice absorber of light. Here's how that actually looks in practice. Um, so this is the haemoglobin molecule, um, and this is the, uh, what happens when uh, oxygen binds. It just slightly changes its conformation, and that small change in conformation is enough to change the electron localization in this ring around the ion in the center, um, and that leads to a dramatic difference in the absorption profiles as a function of wavelength. Now, adding those two things together, this color imaging and this um, hemoglobin absorption spectrum, explains how we um, come to images um, in our standard endoscopy. If we look at a few um, example pictures, so here's some more um, upper GI tract pictures, um, again at the boundary between the stomach and the esophagus. These are all patients that have suspicious lesions. And looking at these, you might be able to appreciate the challenge that the endoscopist faces, which is that these early lesions are extremely hard to spot. So the first observation is um, perhaps that, you know, the overall visualization of the image is pink, and that's because the absorption of blood is primarily strongest in the blue and the green, so most of the reflected light is red. Um, and then we look at it and we say, oh, actually, so this is where the endoscopist has told us there are lesions. It's here, over here, and over here. And one might say, oh, well, you know, why not here? Why not over there? It's actually quite a challenging problem. And the reason that it's hard um, to appreciate is that the lesions that we're trying to look for, these subtle areas of dysplasia or uh, cancer risk, are actually just a slightly different shade of pink to the intrinsic tissue. Um, and this comes down to a fundamental problem with human biology, which is that the tricky thing about imaging in the red, green, and blue is that our eyes are much better at seeing some colors than others. So I couldn't let you get away without having a little interactive trick here. So I'd like you to take a look at these color squares, numbered one, two, three, and four. Um, and I'm gonna just go and ask for a show of hands as I go through. Um, who can tell the difference between the color squares in number one? Okay. Who can tell the difference between the color squares in number two? Number three? And number four? Okay, good, so there was a general increase as we went through those. Um, okay, the next bit of audience participation, um, we're gonna identify the biggest color difference. So if you think number one squares show the biggest color difference, put your hand up. Number two, number three, number four. Okay, so this is an interesting kind of psychophysical study on uh, human perception. There's actually the wavelength distance between the two squares in all of those cases is exactly the same. But our ability to perceive it is highly varied. Um, so you'll have noticed with the biggest color difference, I think numbers two and four were the most popular, and one and two, one and three were the most challenging. So this is part of the reason why endoscopists struggle so much to see early signs of cancer, because even for a very large difference in wavelength, there's only a very small difference in color perception. So what we really need to do is find a way to map that um, difference in optical absorption uh, into a, a different color interpretation, which will really help them to then visualize the lesions. And we already know that there are ways to do this. So this standard of care white light endoscopy that's just looking at the reflected red, green, and blue color channels um, is sensitive to light between about 400 and 700 nanometers. Um, we can also use sort of depth resolved techniques to help us out, but those can be a bit more challenging. And if we just um, actually, instead of looking at the entire spectrum between 400 and 700 nanometers, constrict our view using a technique called narrowband imaging to the absorption peaks of oxygen deoxyhemoglobin here, 
you can already see you get a very different colour contrast. And if we zoom right in, we can actually already see the vascular networks that are arising in suspicious lesions. So these give endoscopists a small improvement in being able to visualise um, the changes in the vascular patterns. What we thought then was, well, why not, why not, why stop there? Why just look at two narrow bands? Why not um, measure the entire spectral information in a series of narrow bands so that we could look at both the blood content and the vascular patterns? We can look at the mucosal changes as we go from those flat squamous cells into those more columnar goblet cells. And we can also look at how well oxygenated the tissue is and whether that gives us an indication on tissue metabolism. The trouble with trying to gather all of this spectral information is that there isn't a clinical device that allows us to do that. So if we, from a research and development perspective, we have to think about how can we collect these wavelength resolved information from the tissue. Now, if we go back to the idea of a, a scope design, I showed you uh, a bit earlier the idea of um, an endoscope being a long tube with a camera and a light source at the tip. And that's what we typically call a chip on tip endoscope. Those are the current standard of care. They operate in 4K, Ultra HD, and provide really high quality spatial information for the clinician to interpret. However, if we wanted to add different color channels onto this, there would be a very strict trade-off between spatial, spectral, and temporal resolution. And more importantly, from a research perspective, there's an incredibly long regulatory pathway that you go through from conceiving a new idea to having a commercially available clinically approved device that you can put in a patient. So we have to find an intermediate approach, and the way that we do that is we take the existing clinically approved endoscope, but we introduce into it uh, a fiber optic bundle which can relay out the light to all of our uh, imaging optics that sit on a trolley outside of the patient. And this is a nice compromise because it allows us to use an, um, a device that's already available that our endoscopist is used to using but it allows us to also collect additional information to test our hypothesis and see whether having this additional wavelength resolved information could be useful from a diagnostic perspective. So I'll talk to you first about um, the work we've done to establish a baby scope. And then I'll also explain how we might modify the existing chip on tip endoscopes to take advantage of that information in the future. We were very lucky then to be able to find what we call a baby scope architecture that would allow us to do this first in human testing. This is a commercially available disposable catheter into which one can introduce a fiber optic bundle. And this is a very low resolution imaging device. If you think about fiber optics uh, used for telecommunications, they will transfer light very effectively, but in order to build up some spatial information, we have to bunch a load of them together so typically we bunch around 10,000 fibers together into one fiber bundle, and each individual fiberlet within that bundle is a single pixel. So instead of now having megapixel quality imaging, we have kilopixel quality imaging, which doesn't sound quite so impressive, but it does at least give us a, a picture from which our endoscopist can visualize. Um, we can add our own illumination input, so we're able to adjust the um, wavelengths of light that we're putting in, and we're then also able to collect the light back via the fiber bundle, and the whole catheter gets thrown away at the end of each use, and the fiber optic gets reused. So the strategy here is um, simply to allow us to gather this spectroscopic information. Now, the other challenge with this is that as you move the endoscope around inside a patient, you have a lot of artifacts that are introduced. The um, scope can get closer to or further from the tissue, so we have a magnification problem. It can get rotated as um, the clinician's looking around, so we have a rotational problem. And broadly speaking, we then have to figure out a way to gather all of our wavelength resolved information in both um, you know, two dimensions um, and reconstruct this into a data set that we can actually use. So the way that we go about this is using um, what we call a line scanning hyperspectral endoscope. So before I go into that, I'll just outline what a, a point scanning device looks like, and then it's much more obvious what a line scanning one looks like. A, a point scanning spectrometer takes a, a point of light, either focused through an objective or from a fiber optic, interrogates that specific region, and as it relays the light back, um, applies it to some dispersion optics, which might be as simple as a prism or might be more complex, such as a diffraction grating. 
um, and images onto a one-dimensional detector. So at any given point in space or time where I'm applying this um, point detector, I can get, get a single spectrum. If I go to a line scanning approach, I now have a line of light that I'm going to um, apply, and I might actually physically um, define a line on my sample and image that line of light, or I might broadly illuminate my sample and use um, optics to cut a line at the back, which I then project into my spectrometer. So in our case here, we have the tip of our endoscope as usual. We have our 10,000 fibers running through our endoscope, and the picture of those 10,000 fibers then gets imaged onto an objective lens. And that image that we're taking through then gets split in two directions. We send part of the light to a standard white light camera. So we are always watching those 10,000 fibers as they're moving around and we're monitoring the field of view. And then the rest of the light gets sent through to a 2D spectrometer. So what that means is this is the, the circular image of my 10,000 fibers that are all bundled together in a single cylinder. I apply a slit across the front of that and I image that slit onto a diffraction grating which disperses along one dimension in wavelength and in the other dimension I've got spatial information. So I've got the spatial information in uh, let's say Y and then uh, wavelength information along lambda and then my um, clinician will scan around and build up the X dimension. So the advantage of this is that it, when it comes to um, building up our, our data set, we're able to compensate for any geometric distortions that have happened as the clinician has been waving the endoscope around. So if it has rotated or been magnified, we can use the white light imaging information and a series of computer vision tools to help us calculate the transformations and the distortions that are happening from one frame to the next. And we can then apply that information to the spectral data that we collect in order to reconstruct what we call a hyperspectral data cube. So a cube of data where spatial information is in two dimensions and wavelength information is in others. So if I want to build up a panoramic image, I'm going to just use a very simple test chart to build that up. What you see at the bottom here is a white light panoramic image. And on the right hand side is individual samples from this 3D data set of spectrum information that I've got. So I can now at an arbitrary wavelength um, across the spectral range that I'm imaging from 400 nanometers to 700 nanometers, pick a wavelength and I can see the image of that wavelength. Now, the first thing we did then was to evaluate um, how this performs with human tissues. Um, so we have these um, biopsy samples that our clinical colleagues were taking from different regions of tissue, and we measured the spectral data. And you can see that as you go from healthy squamous epithelium to a patient with Barrett's, we get a change in the spectral feature, and this change is completely associated with the absorption of light by blood. And as we go towards cancer, we see a further change in that. In this particular case, we actually see a change that's more dominated by deoxygenated blood. We also then have to say, OK, I've got a device, I've set it up, I can measure spectra, I can measure them from tissue. Can I do this in real time in a patient? Um, so before we get to that step, we do some training in um, organs. So this is a pig esophagus model. It's effectively a pig esophagus attached to a stomach, which you can get from your local butchers. It's the discard um, of the meat products. And we get a clinical endoscope, which is designed for veterinary use. And we introduce our endoscope into that. Um, and then you can see what happens when we run the video. So we get our very grainy 10,000 pixel image and we move it around in the, um, in the esophagus from the pig. And while we're doing that, we're in real time gathering spectral images and we can look at any given wavelength to see what's happening. So this convinced us that everything was working well. And in a few moments, I'll show you some of the trial data that we got from using these approaches. Um, but in the meantime, I want to show you, you know, how would this actually be deployed in practice? There are many different ways that one might think about taking this um, kind of spectral data that we are collecting and actually doing it in a clinical setting. One way you could do this is by tailoring the chip-on-tip camera that I already showed you about. So in our conventional camera cameras, we have this RGB matrix of filters, and we have our underlying monochrome sensor that's responding to the number of photons that fall on it. So anything that's coming through the blue filter is um, giving us a blue response and so on. However, this color response is not the only one that I could choose. 
I could then tailor my pixels in order to have different colour responses that would be better targeted towards the particular disease that I want to measure, or that would even have a very high level of high, or high density of spectral sampling to allow me to look at different characteristics if I'm not already aware of that. Major problem here is that tailoring these different filter arrays to different tissue properties becomes quite cumbersome and expensive. How we typically make these filters is using either color, pigmented color dyes or dielectric stacks. And we deposit them directly onto the sensors using different types of exposure dose in lithography processes. So you'll effectively put over a mask that will cover up all of the pixels that you don't want to be covered in your particular color filter. Um, you'll then put down your dye, and you'll remove that mask and put down another one, and put down the next dye, remove that mask, put down another one, move to the next dye. So if you imagine now, instead of doing three colors, I want to do nine colors or 16 colors. I'm going to be there a very long time putting different masks down and allowing different colors to come through. To compensate for that then, we came up with a technology that allows us to customize these optical filters very easily. Um, and it's based on the principle of a fabry perot etalon, which is a cavity, which is flanked by two mirrors and has an insulator in the middle. And the property of this cavity is that the thickness of the cavity is proportional to the wavelength of the light that it will pass. So by building on this um, characteristic, we can make cavities of different heights to pass different wavelengths of light through. And the reason this is valuable is that it's much more scalable from a fabrication process um, perspective than this iterative process of adding different color dyes many, many different times. So in our case, we can um, apply different doses in a single exposure without having to do these different masking steps. And that means that we can make cavities of all different heights, which correspond to cavities of different colors um, as a function of different um, exposure doses. What that means is we can then tailor from the standard red, green, and blue out to more complex scenes. So this is a red, green, and blue filter that we've made ourselves and, and done some imaging with. And here's a much more complicated version of the filter array. Now we can have nine different color bands and we can apply that to the camera in the same way. And again, then we can do imaging and show that that is functional. What we do with that then is instead of sampling just red, green, and blue color channels, we now design a, a method which allows us to subsample in the blue, um, subsample in the green, subsample in the red. So we don't lose any of our existing spatial information, but we gain additional spectral information. And this is very much a work in progress because it's depending on the knowledge gained from doing these in vivo um, human studies using the spectroscopy tools that I've introduced in the beginning with the baby scope. So let's have a look at how that data is coming along. We've done quite a lot of work um, so far, if I think about the translational pathway from research and development through to clinical application, um, what I've shown you is um, the work we've done sort of in discovery, realizing that this is an interesting um, cancer phenomenon that one could um, monitor with endoscopy. We've then done some testing in um, ex vivo tissues, pig tissues, in human tissues. Um, and what we want to do now is move beyond this kind of uh, laboratory-based testing into these first um, human testing. And part of the reason for that is not just that one needs to demonstrate that the technology is relevant in a clinical setting. It's also that the discovery phase is actually somewhat flawed unless you do that. And unless you actually go into a living, breathing human whose blood is circulating, um, your discovery phase is actually quite limited. You might find that deoxygenated blood is a really good biomarker, but then well, if your tissue is not oxygenated because it's not inside the human and the blood isn't flowing, you don't know whether you're just seeing an artifact of the system you're testing in uh, rather than something that's actually um, um, what you want to measure. So a few years ago now, we set up a, a study um, to actually start to design this. This was um, five years ago when we first got our approval for running this study, and it followed over the subsequent three years, and we then spent a year investigating all of the data and writing it up. And the goal of this study was to assess the feasibility of imaging with a spectral endoscope and to evaluate any spectral imaging patterns that were associated with the healthy tissue um, versus the um, Barrett's esophagus and the early signs of cancer. So what do we do in the clinic? We um, introduced the endoscope into the upper GI tract and we had our standard of care display for the endoscopist to, to work from. 
and we brought our own trolley worth of um, optics kit into the, um, into the hospital. We have our own light source and coupling optics. This is the disposable catheter system that I showed you earlier. And out comes our data, um, both for the color camera and for the spectrometer. And we relay all of this through this disposable catheter system. The spectrometer gathers data, and it can display it to the clinician, but they're not used to seeing that data, so they're not using it to make decisions. We then set up a protocol where we had to co-register the data that we took with the final diagnosis from the patient, which is done through a process called histopathology. And in that process, the, the tissue is taken out from the patient, it's sliced into very thin sections, it's stained and then visualized under a microscope. Now, to illustrate what we would do, um, the endoscopist would go in and identify regions that they thought were suspicious and, and mark them out. We would then go in with our spectral endoscope and gather spectroscopy data from those suspicious regions. Um, those regions would be biopsies, so what you see here is the hole where the tissue's been taken out um, and then that's been an analysed. And then you'll get these very high resolution microscopy images where the pathologist will go away and, and give a diagnosis and we will try to then relate the pathology diagnosis to the, um, the spectra. So it's worth noting at this point that we are all human and so are doctors. Um, so we have an endoscopist that tells us something is suspicious and we also have a pathologist who gives us a definitive diagnosis. Um, and when we line those two up, they don't always agree. Um, so there are several cases where our, our endoscopist thought something was suspicious, but in fact it was fine, and vice versa, our endoscopist thought something was fine and it was actually suspicious. Um, so you have to account for a lot of these different variabilities when you're working at the clinical interface. Um, we don't have the five sigma precision of physicists anymore. We're all fallible and we're all working with human beings. So we started to then look into these spectral characteristics in more detail. Um, and these are the average spectra that we got over all the, all the different patients in the trial. Um, so there's more than 700 spectra that have been averaged here to show you these data. And we first looked into the variation within and between patients. And this is a really important characteristic to evaluate if you want to develop a new diagnostic, because you need to understand what biological variation one would expect um, in a given person, but also what biological variation one would expect um, you know, across a patient population. But what sort of confidence can you actually have in the data that you're extracting? So as we might expect, um, these graphs are going up from left to right. So as you get, go from normal healthy esophagus um, into um, Barrett's and then into esophageal cancer, um, you get a much higher variation. So cancer is a much more disordered tissue and uh, our data are more highly varied in the cancer tissues. So that's somewhat expected. Um, also, there's much less variation within a patient than there is between patients. And again, that's what we would expect. So these are quite encouraging findings. We didn't um, come across any technical errors in the, the data collection. And so then we moved on to looking at actually modeling these spectra to try and extract some biological characteristics from them. And what we can do with this sort of biophysical modeling process is we can use our optical models to predict what the absorption features of tissue should look like under different characteristics. And one of those characteristics would be changing the uh, oxygen saturation of the tissue, so changing the proportion of oxygenated and deoxygenated hemoglobin in a given unit cell. And another thing we can do is change like, the expected radius of the vessels, so how much kind of volume percentage is being occupied by the hemoglobin versus background tissue. And these spectra here are the results of those simulations, showing you how the attenuation of tissue varies as a function of vessel radius, with the thicker lines being thicker vessels, and also as a function of SO2, with the colour map from blue to red and um, being a change in oxygenation. And if we set up these models, we can then fit our data to these models to extract some of these optical properties. And the fitting results show us that actually in this particular cohort of patients, we don't see any difference between um, the oxygen saturation in the different disease states. But we do see significant changes in the size of the vessels as we go from healthy to disease tissue, and also um, in the amount of blood volume that's present. And this is something that we might understand by thinking about the changes in the structure of the tissue as we go towards the disease state. Now, our spectral endoscope can capture data only from a relatively superficial region of the mucosa, a few hundred microns of depth. 
And that's because light will be um, very strongly scattered by biological tissue. And so its it, penetration into the tissue is relatively limited before it undergoes an, an event that scatters or absorbs it. The data that we are measuring is that the photons that have been scattered and, uh, or reflected back to our endoscope. Um, and we are there only sensitive to a few hundred microns of depth. And we know, biologically speaking, that in um, vascular remodeling, these vessels tend to start to um, protrude upwards towards the tissue surface. So in the normal tissue, the region we interrogate actually doesn't have uh, very many vessels, which we can see here by the low blood content. But those that are there are typically um, more um, mature and well functional and oxygenated. And as we go towards disease, we tend to get less mature vessels, um, but more of them. And that's what we see in our data. And what we're doing at the moment is trying to validate these findings by using those um, tissue specimens that have been excised, sectioned, and stained, and then quantifying from those how many vessels are present using um, different um, image analysis tools. Um, and actually extracting from multiplex staining uh, for multiple different markers um, how, that, how um, uh, mature the data are, looking at different regions of the tissue. We can also use um, multispectral cameras to do this kind of analysis. Um, and in some of the data that we've shown there, we've been able to get very high accuracies for um, diagnosing different levels of disease, and particularly for the early diagnosis of these neoplastic and dysplastic lesions. And as I said before, the image quality isn't great, but if we look at a region that's um, just assigned to one disease type, we're able to get a spatial classification there as well. We also did a second pilot study in the colon to, to understand how much of the findings that we had from the upper GI tract could translate to the lower GI tract. Um, so here's a photo of our somewhat more compact optical system, still on a trolley next to the standard endoscopy suite. Um, here are some of those wide field images from the colon, building up a panorama as we sweep around, reconstructing that panorama and extracting some spectra. In this preliminary study, we again got some good discrimination between, so in this case, polyps as a um, kind of precursor lesion in um, the colon, um, between the polyps and the healthy region. Um, and we can use a range of different tools to be able to discriminate between these. But one of the challenges is actually how to interpret all of these data. And what you find is that um, when you present these spectral data to a um, clinician, it's not immediately obvious how they should use that information. Um, so what we did was um, we thought about whether we could use a more simple color-based classification um, to give them uh, the data and present it to them in a meaningful way. And so the way that we went about doing this was effectively thinking about reducing the data back down from the hyperspectral data set into, and mapping it into a color space that's more obvious for a human to interpret. Um, this is a simple example um, shown here where you take a color chart with um, a series of different colors that are well defined. Um, you can image those directly and do a color-based classification there. And this is an example of how it might map in real time um, if you were a patient, uh, if you were an endoscopist looking down um, a, a fiber bundle. But that's again still complicated because now we've still got multiple different colors. So the question is, could we make a synthetic image that would replace the standard color image um, that would be even more useful? And to go about that, we said, okay, well, usually we have red, green, and blue color channels with a, a certain wavelength center and a certain bandwidth. If we did an optimization where we uh, ran an algorithm to say, uh, allow, you, allow you to look at any particular wavelength center band or any particular bandwidth, um, what would you get out in your, in your simulation that could maximize the color difference? So the process that we went through was to say, okay, these are the spectral responses of a standard white light endoscope. We're going to simulate a region of healthy squamous tissue next to it with a region of non-dysplastic Barrett's esophagus and embedded with that a region of abnormality. And we're going to sample the spectra that we obtained in our trial according to those color filters. And if we did that, that's how the image would look. It would give us a color contrast of about three. Um, and that explains why the color contrast is relatively poor in white light endoscopy. If we did it for the narrowband approach where we already can highlight the vasculature, um, as I showed you right back at the start, you get a six fold difference. But if you run our optimization algorithm for the, the data that we've collected, we show that you could actually get a 27-fold enhancement in contrast between the early cancer and the Barrett's esophagus. So this could really improve the ability of the clinician to see the signs of cancer 
which given at the moment we have up to 50% miss rates in an endoscopy for finding early cancer, um, could actually make a massive impact on the lives of a lot of patients. So where do we go from this um, very preliminary data? Well, the first thing we have to do is try to um, cross-validate this in um, more, more studies across more centres. The second thing we want to do is actually a more detailed analysis of the optical properties of tissue, particularly in early disease. And we have some interesting trials going on to achieve that. We need to improve um, our, our models and our classification accuracies using um, histopathology tools, do testing of these chip-on-tip methods. We need to test in other disease settings. As I've shown you, we looked a little bit in the colon. And we also could test in other imaging settings, for example, in surgery. So just in the last couple of minutes, what would be the vision for the future? How might we change the existing paradigm? So this white light endoscopy is our existing paradigm. It's relatively macroscopic imaging, and it gives us a relatively poor contrast. So could we do something where we could uh, zoom in, as well as doing this contrast enhancement? The problem is, at the moment, we have to do this with multiple different devices if we want to set it up. So could we in the future increase the contrast, but also the resolution, the zoom, and also add some depth resolution so we know how far the disease has penetrated? We've started using um, tools from diffractive optics, which is a, um, a methodology that's used widely in um, astrophysics and other areas, um, to try to apply these in endoscopy and find ways in which we could enhance uh, in a super resolution type setting um, our visualization um, and our image quality um, with a view to having kind of an, an endoscopic implementation with many different colors um, combined with these low cost diffractive optical elements in order to enhance contrast. If we want to expand beyond the visible range, we might also want to go into the broadband and to do that, we need to go out um, into wavelengths of light that neither we can see nor our cameras can see we actually need night vision goggles to get out to these sorts of wavelengths of light. Um, and this is an example of a new camera which has been designed to maximize the benefits of standard silicon cameras, but using a material called INGAS, which is sensitive in these longer wavelengths range. So you can now have cameras that can range all the way from 400 nanometers out to 1800 nanometers, so vision and night vision in one. Um, and you can apply these to measure things like uh, parameters such as water, so going beyond our, our normal complement of parameters from haemoglobin. Um, and we use this as a simple water trick uh, in the lab, so um, a complement of blueberries that under visible light all look the same, but based on the water content in the shortwave infrared, you can identify which ones are overripe and which ones are underripe. Um, and we applied this to a series of tissue specimens from the esophagus. Um, we can image them um, and take some data with them under monochromatic light. When we couple these with um, histopathology classification, we can start to um, make assignments for different disease types from cancer um, and higher grade dysplasia um, down to Barrett's. And so we've shown this broadband information actually looks like it could be really useful in a clinical setting. So what I hope I've kind of convinced you of is that um, haemoglobin in and of itself is quite an, an important molecule for biomedical imaging, and we can do a lot more with it than we do now because the, the shades of pink that we see in abnormal tissue are very subtle, and there are different ways to pull out more contrast by using all of this spectral information. Um, and I hope I've illustrated some of the pathway of doing that. You come from a kind of an idea in physics that we um, want to look at um, color differences in a, in, in a new way, and we can do all of our hardware innovation and we can design new optical filters, but until we actually take those innovations all the way through along the pathway um, and put them into a patient, we can never be um, you know, truly convinced um, whether our idea um, is valid. But to do that, we have to ask for a lot of help along the way. Um, I have some fantastic clinical colleagues here in Cambridge, including Rebecca Fitzgerald and Massimiliano Di Pietro. I've had wonderful collaborators who've helped us to do that. Um, and all of these people have really enabled us as uh, physicists and engineers um, gaining experience across this biological and clinical uh, realm um, to see the true impact of our technologies. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for your attention. I'm happy to invite questions. <laughs>